welcome to Quarantine Historians, maybe or maybe not drinking coffee. Um, I appreciate you joining me. No problem. <laughs> um, I am not drinking coffee, I'm drinking tea because it's in the afternoon. And if I drink coffee right now, I would never go to sleep. Same. I have some oolong tea in my Supreme Court case um, mug, which when you put hot liquid in it, um, the losing side disappears. And only <laughs> the... That's awesome. <laughs> I like that mug. <laughs> Mine is a Harry Potter mug. And it is book three. So it's got the bus. And it's got yes. some Dementors. Mmm, gotta have those. <laughs> I um, picked it because um, you remind me of Sirius Black. Uh, I mean that as a compliment. Okay, all right. Even though, he, it as a like, spoiler alert for anyone watching that hasn't seen Harry Potter. He dies. <laughs> and he spends a lot of time in prison, if I... <laughs> But I mean, it feels, it feels appropriate, right? I mean, we're, we're getting ready to talk about legal stuff. So even better. True. I didn't actually think about him being in prison. I just thought about him as like a loyal friend. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. I'll take it. So I thought um, it would be interesting to talk about some of the overlap between um, law and history. Give us a little bit of your background so that people understand why I invited you. <laughs> okay, well, I don't know that exactly, but um, my name is Rhett Jameson Fuller. I'm from Durham, North Carolina. Um, I went to North Carolina Central University for undergrad and graduated with a major in psychology and history. So history has always been... Um, one of my interests, uh, certainly. Then I attended North Carolina Central School of Law. Uh, so I'm a double eagle. And uh, while I was there, I focused on civil rights. Um, had a couple really great um, instructors, Dr. Irving Joyner and Dr. Scott Holmes, who um, both really opened my eyes to a lot of the systemic issues that we faced uh, as a nation um, dealing with race. Um, and so I thought it would be interesting to go over some of the more important uh, kind of landmark cases, both in North Carolina and the US Supreme Court regarding civil rights and interweave that with the life of Dr. Julius Chambers who um, unfortunately is lesser known than a lot of other civil rights leaders. Probably the most important civil rights attorney in North Carolina's history, and certainly one of the most important in the nation's history. Um, so that's kind of what I was thinking today. Yeah, I like it. It's, <laughs> it's literally the opposite of Zebulon Vance. Well, and also, um, Dr. Chambers had a master's in history, so a little overlap there as well. He's an attorney and historian. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's do it. The Dred Scott case, obviously, um, that a lot of people consider maybe the most infamous case in Supreme Court history, which ruled that slaves were not citizens, could never be citizens, so they couldn't um, sue the government in 1896 to Plessy v. Ferguson. And that was the case that kind of sets up everything else to come. So after the 14th amendment was passed, which basically uh, to me is the, I think it's where America kind of our experiment with democracy really begins in earnest because now it's not exclusionary. It's all persons cannot be discriminated against. You know, you have the equal protection clause, which is where a lot of the um, 
latter cases is what they um, are, a lot of the claims are pursuant to. Um, so Plessy v. Ferguson, Homer Plessy, he was actually, I think, like one eighth black, um, tried to ride a, a uh, white only rail car in New Orleans. They said no. Supreme Court said that equal protection doesn't mean uh, complete equality. They don't have to be together. You can't make the races equal as long as they are separate. But um, forgot the exact language, but mostly equal, reasonably equal. Um, and um, in his dissent, Justice Harlan, he was the only dissenter, it was a 7 1 decision said the constitution is colorblind, neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. Um, unfortunately, that, that opinion um, would not become the more mainstream for quite a while. So I think that's kind of where things, that, that kind of is the setup for the civil rights um, struggle in the middle of the last century. Mm -hmm. That brings us to 1936, when Levon Chambers was born. He was born to William and Matilda Chambers. His father was a mechanic, and his mother was a teacher and Sunday school teacher. Um, he was the third of four children and was born in Mount Gilead in Montgomery County. Because his father was such a good mechanic and had some money, he was a, they were able to send um, the, older two stu the older two siblings to the Laurenburg Academy in Scotland County, um, which was regarded as a, as a much better school than um, the Peabody High School. His older siblings go to Laurenburg Academy. He's really excited to go to Laurenburg Academy. And then his senior year in high school, um, his father at this point has struck out on his own, has his own um, mechanic shop. Unfortunately, he had a really, he had one person that came in that had a bunch of some trucks or something like that to fix. And when the bill came due, the guy refused to pay. Mm. And in that time, he couldn't make him pay. Um, tried to hire legal counsel. Nobody would take the case um, because nobody's going to represent a black guy suing a white guy for money. So the guy literally just said, I'm not paying you. Um, unfortunately, the, the, the bill was so large, I think they said it was equivalent to about a year's salary for him or a year's profits. So that meant that... Levon Chambers was unable to go to Laurenburg Academy. He wanted to join his two older siblings there, but instead he had to go to um, Peabody High School for Negroes. Um, just to give you a little example of some of the differences, um, that public school had one bus, so the students were most of the students were on their own for getting there. And, you know, in, in this county is kind of pretty spread out, rural. A lot of people just couldn't even get there. Mm -hmm. um, had no, no science lab with any equipment. Had no gymnasium. Mm -hmm. um, they were so short-staffed that some of the older students taught science and math classes while they were still in school. And they had no library. Um, some of the only books that they got from, I think, you know, that had been passed down or gotten from other ways were kept in the, in the shop, shop class. Um, mm. so as you can imagine, that puts you at quite a disadvantage, um, growing up and to make matters worse, there were three public libraries in Montgomery County, but unfortunately none of them allowed black people, they were all segregated. So literally no access to a library. Mm -hmm. um, it's around this time that it's kind of a mystery, but Dr. Chambers took on the name Julius. Nobody you knows know exactly. Why? 
some people say that that he read Julius Caesar and liked the name. Um, it's kind of a mystery, but hmm. from then on, he went as Julius Levon Chambers, um, known as Julius Chambers. So that's what happened then. Um, so he graduates high school in 1954, just a few days um, after Brown B. Board of Education was his graduation. So literally the same month that Brown was decided he graduated high school, um, decided to go to college. So that leads us to Brown, which is one of, obviously one of the most important um, decisions in Supreme Court history history, which kind of took a, a, a sledgehammer to Plessy and Ferguson in, in the arena of education. But, mm -hmm. um, so you have two other figures that were very important in the civil rights struggle um, litigation. You have Charles Hamilton Houston, who's known as the man who dismantled Jim Crow. He was a Harvard graduate, dean of Howard Law School, and then worked closely or worked for the NAACP, kind of started their um, litigation strategy to challenge all these laws all over the country. And they all kind of culminated in, in Brown. Mm. And Underneath him was Thurgood Marshall, who was the main um, plaintiff's attorney arguing um, at the Supreme Court for Brown. And he obviously went on to be a Supreme Court justice, the first African-American Supreme Court justice. Mm -hmm. And so their strategy in the arena of education was uh, the courts had stated in Plessy that if you're not going to integrate, you basically have to have two separate, but they have to be substantially equal. So they wanted to make it so expensive that it would be more cost efficient just to integrate. So mm -hmm. in all these cases, they, they took great pains to show, the te you know, teacher salaries, facilities, money spent, you know, those needed to be, right on par in order for it to be constitutional under the 14th amendment. Mm -hmm. So after quite a few of those cases chipping away at it, they get to, to Brown and it's in Topeka, Kansas. And in that case, essentially the Supreme court says, um, you know, in, in schooling separate is never equal. It, it, it just isn't. Um, right. So, in that sense, segregation is now unconstitutional. However, they didn't give much guidance on on how to do that, and they didn't they weren't specific on whether it's just you can't segregate or do you have a duty to integrate uh -huh. if that, that makes sense mm -hmm. so as soon as that happens, all these school districts and states and, and counties, especially in the South, are up in arms over Brown. They, they, you know, as we know in history, Alabama and Arkansas defiantly, you know, fighting it where the National Guard has to be called in. Virginia completely shut down their public schools for a while. Um, it's just, you know, it's insanity reigning, honestly, for a while. So... Then you have Brown part two, which is 1955, where the court comes back and says, you're not doing this fast enough. You need mm -hmm. to, you need to work. I believe the words are with all deliberate speed mm -hmm. to integrate. Now, what exactly does all deliberate speed mean? <laughs> Fortunately with the Supreme court, most of it is just parsing words and definitions. Mm -hmm. So, an immediate response to that, lots of counties, like I said, backlash, so they start planning on how they can avoid integration. Right. In North Carolina, 
in North Carolina, um, they decide to put in place the Pearsall plan. Um, in other states, they just basically said, we're not doing it. Mm. Had a fight. North Carolina decided to take a more moderate approach. Moderate, but I think it was also just sneakier. I think they realized they weren't going to, they weren't going to win a head on battle, but if they say, Hey, we're working on it. Hey, we're doing some stuff. Then maybe the, the federal government would leave them alone. So the Pearsall plan took pupil placement out of the state's hands and put it into each individual school district. What this does is make it much harder to sue, um, to make the change because you have to go after each district. Second, they changed the classifications on how students would be um, assigned. So it wasn't by race, but they could do it by neighborhood or, you know, income, things like that. And it's de facto segregation, which means you're not specifically saying by law we're segregating by race, but in effect, and the facts are that it is segregated. Mm-hmm. Um, when you, when you were talking about like the, how North Carolina is basically, you know, um, making it more difficult, but they're kind of like staying within the rules, right? Like legally. Yeah. So, I mean, it makes me think about, um, Vance, honestly, and how he would work within the legal system. So he would do things to, um, that sometimes seemed like they were good, but weren't, weren't. <laughs> for example, like even seceding from the union, um, he was not for secession. And a lot of times people will read that in the exhibit that we have and think, oh, well, he must have been <laughs> pro-slavery and I'm like, or um, against slavery, sorry. And I'm like, no, no, he was, he was pro-slavery. He just thought that staying in the union and he wanted to do it legally he didn't want to like secede from the union he wanted to stay within it and follow within the structure that was already there he thought that was the better way to continue and keep slavery the way he wanted it um so i think it can be a little misleading sometimes much more insidious you know and and honestly the 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 planners of the pearsall plan probably learned from the civil war like if you go head on with the federal government, mm -hmm. it's not going to work out. So right. if you try to work within the framework, you can get around a lot of stuff because a lot of times, unfortunately, I think um, with the federal government, they come out on the right side, but a lot of times they still want to appease both sides. So they'll give you some loopholes. I mean, mm -hmm. they're not going to, I mean, e even with, even with, integration i mean you have some places that weren't integrated until the 70s mm -hmm. brown was 54 it's a lot of time yeah to, right. to not integrate after to think that you know we're not still feeling the impacts of that right now <laughs> is yeah um, i would argue unrealistic <laughs> but and to get a little controversial um i think a lot of people like to to feel better about the country by thinking that a lot of those court decisions were outliers. It was a rogue judge, you know, mm. but if you look at the constitution, a lot of them were not, you know, mm. like how do you, with, with, with dread Scott, you know, it's named the, the, the worst decision ever, but there's a case to <laughs> Literally, the worst decision ever. The worst decision ever, yeah, it's ranked that, usually. I think we like to think of it, like I said, as, as these are outliers, but this is who we are. This is what we were founded on, and it takes a lot to, to change those, um, those ideals, I think. And so, when you, when, you, when you read some of these opinions, it's like, especially Dred Scott, because the judge goes out of his way to talk about how inferior black people are and, and all this stuff. I think he was trying to justice Tanny trying to really put an end to the debate to try to stave off a civil war. And in fact, mm -hmm. it was 
one of the major instigators of it. Mm -hmm. Um, it upset people so much, um, was, was the language he used and how he just, it was really unnecessary what he said to, to get his ruling across. Um, but anyway, Sorry. Back to where we. I derailed no. us. <laughs> no problem. I think we were back on uh, Brown and Brown Two, and yeah. so this is the time where we'll go back to Dr. Chambers. He goes off to college, and he's very excited to go to college. He goes to um, decides to go to North Carolina College for Negroes, which is now North Carolina Central University, my alma mater, and loves it there. He he really thrives he's the freshman class president he, he's the student he's one of the heads of the student government um head of his frat i think he was also the president of the panhellenic society um really just loves the the academic environment um he's also mentored by helen edmonds at the time who's a prolific uh, historian. She's a history instructor at Central. Um, and he really enjoys um, studying under her, learning from her. And he graduates the top of his class. And he gets the uh, a Woodrow Wilson Fellowship, where he can go study for a year and graduate. Um, studies and he decides to go to the University of Michigan where he gets his master's in history and he decides he wants to go to law school um, or he, he had decided that before but it, it, this is the time now where he wants to apply to law school mm -hmm. and a little bit it, it, later on in his life he, he said the the point in his life when he decided that he wanted to be a lawyer was the incident with his father being stiffed by the white man. He really saw that as, as a serious injustice and, and really showed that, that black people, when it came to them trying to obtain relief against a white person, it was impossible. You know, mm -hmm. nobody would case. Um, people would get angry at you, all sorts of things, you know, worse than that even. So that was when he decided he wanted to be an attorney. Mm -hmm. So he's at Michigan, decides he wants to be, he decides this is the time to apply to law school. He wants to go to Michigan. So he meets with their um, admissions officer and the person says, you know, you're a good student, but unfortunately we've already um, <laughs> accepted our one black student to the law school for, for the class. So there's no need for you to apply. So he's upset that he wasn't the one and um, he applies to University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill and to NCCU Law School. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to go back a little bit with the court cases. Well, now I want to know if he got in to... <laughs> I know. I can give you... I got to give you some background now. So, <laughs> like, did he, where did he go? <laughs> okay, fine. Give me, we're gonna go back, give me background. We're going to go back to a court case. It's a really strange name. It's called Missouri x Gains Gaines v. Canada. Okay, so that to me one more time. <laughs> Missouri x e x rel r e l Gaines v. Canada. Okay. What did that do? So, so that's 1938, and Thurgood Marshall is the attorney for this case. Um, basically, a uh, black man wanted to go to um, the University of Missouri Law School. Um, okay. He had graduated from Lincoln University, which was uh, a black school in Missouri, decided he mm -hmm. wanted to go there. They wouldn't let him in, so he sued. Um, the court said, you got two decisions. You can integrate your law school, or you can build a black law school, but you have to be able, because of the separate, separate but equal, you have to have a legal education for um, 
black students. Okay. Right. So this scares a bunch of other states, right? So this okay. is 1938. 1939, North Carolina, the state of North Carolina opens law school at North Carolina School College for Negroes, NC Central. So their law school literally opens the very next year because they don't want any black people attending UNC. That's, you know, it's the state, the state university, the pride and joy. I, I forgot the numbers, but I mean, it's basically a majority of the Congress people. Well, that's where Vance went. Right. Uh, well, you know, I forgot what percentage of the of the North Carolina bar is like 70 80 percent went to UNC like this is this is it so mm -hmm. they want to they want that mm -hmm. so they're trying to plan ahead mm. and say okay well you don't get to go to UNC but because you got we, we built you another one mm -hmm. so fast forward to 1950 Dr. Chambers was in high school at this time so you have Sweat v. Painter in Texas. Herman Sweat, black man, wanted to go to the University of Texas School of Law. They didn't have a, a school of law either. So the district court, in a surprising move, continued the case for six months, which allowed the University of Texas to build a, college, a law school right. for black people. Mm -hmm. Black men. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. The court found that it's not just having another school. You got you to gotta take into account um, intangible factors. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, mo like, like we said with UNC, most of the people from UNC Law School are, are, are the bar. If you don't meet, you don't network with those people, you don't uh, bounce ideas off each other, you don't learn from each other, um, you don't get the prestige of the college. There's more than, than, than just the basic academics. Mm -hmm. um, so that has to be considered as a part of um, substantive, substantive equality. Right. So, 1951, following Sweat v. Painter, then you have... McKissick v. Carmichael, and that's in UNC. Mm -hmm. Floyd McKissick and a few other um, black people decide they want to go to the UNC School of Law. Seems pretty obvious that UNC is going to lose this, right? I mean, the, the facts are very similar. Doesn't matter. UNC puts up a fight, so we're not going to do it. Case gets it's going. District court actually rules for UNC. Shockingly, I know. <laughs> um, but in in that case, they they took great pains to to compare, you know, how much money went into each. But not only that, the the experience of the instructors, how many instructors they had, the placement of the student, what jobs they went to afterward, all this stuff. And I believe that was Thurgood Marshall, again, um, in that case, handling that one. He might have done sweat as well, honestly. Uh, I think he did. And so it gets kicked up to the Fourth Circuit, and they say, no, you have to follow sweat. You have to accept, um, you have to accept uh, black people into your law school. Mm -hmm. So that was 1951. Fast forward to uh, when Julius Chambers is applying. He takes his LSAT, bombs it. Really, really bad, like near the bottom. Um, but he is accepted into the UNC School of Law, probably because he had great grades, had a master's degree from a prestigious uh, university. And um, in the incoming class, he is ranked 112th out of 114th. Hmm. So, not have high hopes for him. However, after the first year, he is second in the class. Hmm. Just absolutely crushes it. Um, 
feel like it says a lot about testing right now, but that's a whole nother conversation. <laughs> yeah, it, I believe that it does. Um, <laughs> I don't even want to, I don't even want to dip my toe in that. <laughs> we'll just keep nah, No, we'll stay away from that. First semester of a second year, all A's, first in his class. Hmm. And this is without much help from professors. It said a lot right. of the professors would even call on black students, didn't give them any help. Um, mm -hmm. Said there were a couple that did, but but few and far between for sure. Mm. After this, the first semester of your 2L year in law school, this is when the law review is, is picked. Um, the editors and, and associate editors. Mm -hmm. Normally, it was just whoever was first in the class was the editor of the law review. Very prestigious role. Uh, you know, when when you're going to apply for jobs, they you know this is a big big deal. Mm -hmm. um, a year before this, year or two before this, they decided that it wouldn't just UNC Law School decided it wouldn't just be whoever was first. They would take into account your writing skills, your um, person not personality but you know other factors basically as a way to i don't know ensure that they could pick who they wanted um there were five there was the <clears throat> editor and the four associates and it came down two to two for him and against him and the outgoing editor voted for him so he became the first law review editor at a you know top tier law school in the south really big deal it's invited to meet um thurgood marshall at this time so he meets with him meets with a lot of other um black attorneys black civil rights leaders it, it's it's a big deal so he continues to be the law review editor while he's in school um, but his final year, he's really focused on what his job's going to be once he finishes mm -hmm. uh, law school. Really wants to to work at one of the big time law firms, mm -hmm. which should be a shoe in as the law review editor. So even with these additional um, responsibilities as law review editor, finishes his last year number one in the class. Order of the Coif, Order of the Golden Fleece at UNC, um, finishes with high honors. I don't honors. know what that. I don't know what that means, but golden it sounds fleece. like a big deal because it's golden. Golden Fleece is a very <laughs> high order at at UNC. Like it's, it's a, a is huge it something deal. that's just at UNC or at all colleges? What is the Order of the Golden Fleece like? I picture a golden bird like from the book. Um, the Hunger Games, the little Mockingjay. Probably, that's probably where they got it from. <laughs> but um, probably they were they were ahead of their time. In, in the past, people who had had those credentials, which there weren't, I don't know how many there were who did both. But I mean, you're picking from New York law firms, DC law firms, the biggest in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately, none of the professors go to bat for him. Normally, if you're a good law student, your professors will make some calls for you, network for you, get you some interviews, things like mm -hmm. that. None of them do that. He doesn't get one interview at a big firm in North Carolina. He gets one in D.C., and the interviewer tells him the only reason they're interviewing him is because one of the partners is a white liberal, and so this is to satisfy that. He decides to go up to Columbia, does his, um, his master's there. While he's there, it's basically a year to try to figure out what he's going to do job-wise. After he does that, still, still nothing on the big firms. So he's upset again, kind of decides he's going to do um, the Department of Justice, tells Robert Kennedy that he tentatively accepts a job in the Justice Department and, and he likes DC so and it, I think his wife had, her sister lived there so it kind of seemed like a good fit um, 
right before they're about to do that, Jack Greenberg, I believe is his name, who is the incoming director of the LDF, who was taking over for Thurgood Marshall, offers him position as their first civil rights intern at the LDF. So this is kind of a big decision, right? He had never really been in college or in law school. He had never gotten involved in, in civil rights. Um, he, I think he knew it was important to him, but he knew that that could keep him from, you know, the, the bar maybe wouldn't admit him if he was seen as a troublemaker or getting involved in that sort of stuff. So he had stayed out of it, but it was very important to him. So he decides he's going to take that position. So he has to call attorney general Robert Kennedy and let him know that he is rescinding his acceptance of the job. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Right. Robert F. Kennedy apparently was very gracious, said it was probably a good decision. He, really admired the work the LDF was doing and wished him the best. So he goes to work at uh, the LDF as their first civil rights intern. And what this program was is the LDF decided to bring in interns to learn with them, um, to go on the road around the country and work with other local affiliated black attorneys or, or some white attorneys too, not, not as many to figure out, what their strategy was and to file Mm -hmm. um, these cases. So he does that for a year, learns a lot. And then he decides he's going to set up shop in North Carolina and he's going to get a stipend from the LDF for three years to help him set up. And then he's going to basically work in concert with them filing civil rights cases in North Carolina. Mm -hmm. So he comes back, decides to set up in Charlotte um, at that time, I believe, counting him, there were four or five black attorneys in Charlotte. Um, so not too many. Mm-mm. And I mean, even at the time, I believe the, you know, there were segregated bathrooms, white and black water fountain in the courthouse, the law library across the street, the bar association, law library across the street didn't allow blacks. So, I mean, here he is coming back. I mean, has had all these successes Mm -hmm. and really uh, achieved, I mean, more than, more than most, Mm -hmm. probably more than most of the attorneys in Charlotte. And he can't even, you know, get into the, the library across the street. So Um, he sets up the first integrated law firm. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was, I was going to say, it makes me think about um, the book that I talked to you about that I'm reading um, before this called Stamped from the Beginning, Mm -hmm. um, written by um, Kindy is the author's name, but um, it talks about the history of racist ideologies in America. um, And it's really long, so I'm not done with it yet. (laughs) But um, he talks about really like there's these two things. Um, I'm not going to say it nearly as eloquently as he does, but basically there are these like kind of two things happening at the same time. Like you're making progress in civil rights. And at the same time, you still have this other storyline that's happening and progression that's also happening on the like racist side of it. There are still like white people making progress. <laughs> And every time you like move forward with something, you know, that's pro like and good for civil rights and equality, you have another side that's also making changes and moving forward. So it's like he's doing all yeah. these things and there are all these legal things that are happening, but then at the same time, you know, oh, white people are adjusting what they're doing to then make that yeah. not as um uh to lessen the impact, I guess, of what's happening. There's like this little. The yeah. 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 So it's like, he's done all this work, but it's like, okay, well, we've allowed for him to do all this work. How can we still hold someone back? And it's like, oh, well, yeah, and a lot of, we can't give them jobs. And a lot of, right. And a lot of times it, it, the progress they make in fact 
is a catalyst for the whites to stop right. because to create such a backlash. They don't, you know, they might not have done some of that stuff beforehand, but seeing black people making progress, then they're like, oh no, we can't have this. Now we right. really have to get motivated. Yeah. 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 That's, that makes total sense. Um, 64, he sets up the office, um, which is actually the same year as the Civil Rights Act of 1964 mm -hmm. uh, established, which um, helps a little bit more in, in some of these um, civil rights cases. And I think it was really a motivator for a lot of the attorneys. Um, without going into too much detail, the Civil Rights Act basically um, outlaws discrimination um, in regards to voting rights, public accommodations, public facilities, um, federally assisted programs, which is a big one because if you can show that uh, an organization or a group gets any federal money, then they are, um, they have to comply with the Civil Rights Act. Mm -hmm. So that gives you another avenue to some of these organizations that maybe before you wouldn't have been able to, because it's not state action, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but now it is state action because just because they take money. Mm -hmm. So that opens things up quite a bit. And he becomes so prominent with all this that, that his law firm becomes known as um, the LDF South legal defense fund South. And yeah. he opens his law firm with James Ferguson another black man from Asheville attorney and I believe Adam Stein, um, white Jewish man who, and that's how they were the first integrated law firm in North Carolina. Mm. So at this point he is basically driving all over North Carolina, meeting with people, all the important civil rights figures and attorneys, and then just uh, potential plaintiffs Mm -hmm. And he's big groups and, and, you know, getting names, trying to, I guess, have as many options as possible for their strategy of attacking Jim Crow. Um, and actually, at one point, he's in New Bern in 65. He's giving a speech down there. They hear a noise outside and somebody comes in and says, oh, somebody just blew your car up. Yep. Somebody put some dynamite under his car, blew it up. And I guess it was on the news. His wife found out. So he had to call her and said, well, I'll just get another car. They blew this one up. And also like, I want to, yeah. How, I mean, she was probably terrified. And it just kind of, it, to, that was another like reflection point for me. It was like, didn't, didn't it stop him at all. It wasn't even like a speed bump to me. I'd be like, all right, let's do something else. <laughs> let's find a different area of law to practice. Like you're blowing up my car. That's kind of, I, I, I think I'm good on that, but that just kind of shows you a different um, type of person. If he files what will end up being his biggest case, um, Swan v. Charlotte Mecklenburg, which is basically saying they're not integrating. Charlotte school system is not integrating fast enough. Mm. And, it gets kicked out, dismissed. His name was James Swan. Wanted to go to, you know, a different high school. And this was the busing case. And so they decided integration wasn't, wasn't coming along fast enough with, you know, with all deliberate speed. And so they wanted to find a different way to um, achieve integration. Hmm. So it gets kicked, brings it back up later. And in um, 71, goes all the way up to the uh, Supreme Court, I believe at the lower level, he lost. And then on appeal, was overturned, I want to say. And mm -hmm. then up to the Supreme Court. So going back to the Pearsall plan, which we had spoken about earlier, how these states had, had rushed to put in place plans that would allow them to 
kind of go slow, drag their feet on integration so that the federal government wouldn't come in and, and get involved. Um, you know, a lot of them were considered uh, what you call freedom of choice plans where, you know, parents are kind of have some degree, I mean, which we see now, you know, school choice. Um, and so uh, Dr. Chambers filed, well, I guess the LDF filed, but he was the presenting attorney, right. um, the, Swan, the Swan case in 1965, and it was dismissed. Um, but then in 1968, the Warren court ruled in green versus uh, school board that freedom of choice plans were not sufficient to eliminate segregation. So um, essentially they said that schools or that districts needed to take more proactive measures to accomplish integration. That was in 68. So Julius Chambers says, okay, let's refile because this is, this is a new, new precedent now. Mm -hmm. So he refiled Swan and he argues before the Supreme court. Surprisingly, um, it's unanimous decision. They all side with, with chambers and the LDF mm -hmm. and they decide that, that busing students is constitutional. Mm -hmm. Uproar again, backlash. Um, if anybody knows anything about busing or lived through this it was a huge deal, basically using busing, taking kids further away from their homes in order to achieve uh, a more diverse school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, typical white kids that would go to their neighborhood schools, which had a lot more money um, because as you know, you know where, where the school funding comes from, the property taxes. So the, richer neighborhoods have more money to put into their schools. So they didn't want integration, basically. They didn't want busing. They didn't want their kids to have to sit on the bus for an hour or, or more to get to um, a school. And they also, a lot of them did not want their kids going to school with black kids, honestly. Mm -hmm. Huge issue. Um, yeah. However, busing worked. It achieved integration, and, and in the years following, in the 70s and 80s, um, I mean, there were all sorts of write-ups about Charlotte, how it was the, the model for, for school integration. Mm -hmm. um, and that was all because of the, the Swan ruling. So that was kind of the, I would say, the highlight of uh, Dr. Chambers' legal career. Um, after uh that, he... Yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, to kind of bring that back, when you were talking about the busing, I was thinking about um, some of the things that um, Vance has said. Because uh, I was kind of joking, but kind of not, at the beginning when I said that Chambers is like literally the opposite of Vance. But if what they said and did, um, <clears throat> it really isn't that far off. Um, but I pulled up some of the quotes um, that I have of his from things he said after the Civil War and um, after the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments were ratified. Um, those, are the best, those are the best amendments. I mean, yes. I mean, that's when things really started, the, the, the Civil War Amendments, yeah, Reconstruction Amendments. Right, in some of his speeches that he gave, he um, declared at one time in 1870s, he said, I have felt it my duty to advance in every laudable way the interests of the colored race in this country. But then he says, um, asserts when they're talking about civil rights, he says, um, he perceived this as a, a misnomer. It's not about civil rights. Um, Vance claims that it's more about social rights. So for example, he explains, there is no railway car in all the South which the colored man cannot ride in. That is his civil right. This bill proposes, and he's speaking to um, a, a bill that was introduced by Senator Charles Sumner um, of Massachusetts, and he was outlawing racial discrimination. 
Um, and so uh, he says this bill proposes that he should have the opportunity or the right to go into a first class car and sit with white gentlemen and white ladies. I submit if that is not a social, uh, if that is not a social right, there is a distinction between the two. And um, he says that it would be detrimental to the interests of both races um, and says robs the colored man more or less of the friendship of the owners of the soil in the South. Um, and then he goes on to say later as well that no race, sir, in the world has been able to stand before the pure Caucasian. An antagonism of races will not be good for the colored man, he states. The, the differences there are, are uh, impossible to miss, mm -hmm. right? And, and, and he's, he's wrong. I mean, not just when you hear it, but they've done studies and, and integrated schools. Uh, not only when, when they first did this, did the, the black students perform better, but all the students perform better overall. Well, um, and I think, you know, what this makes me think about too is um, when people will use the argument, a lot of times people will say, well, he was a man of his time. And I'm like, well, okay, he was, but so was Senator Charles Sumner of Massachusetts who sought to outlaw racial discrimination in jury schools, transportation, public accommodations. Yeah. So, you know. Yeah. That I mean, wouldn't have been a fight if there weren't people on the other side. Like you could have been on, he could have been on the other side, but he mm -hmm. wasn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so what ended up happening, I guess, in, in Charlotte is they put into place in the early 2000s, a school choice plan, which allowed for, for the students and their families to pick their, I guess, to, was considered like their home school, which was basically the one closest to them. Um, or they could try to get into a lottery for one of the magnet schools, but they'd only be, um, they'd only get free transportation to their, their home school or whatever. So what ended up happening is like 90 some percent picked their home school, which basically resegregated the school system again. Um, yeah. And unfortunately, this was, um, that, I forgot what year that was, 2001 or two, and more of these plans started going into place, and then it got kicked up to the Supreme Court, and that was in 2007 with a case called Parents Involved in Community Schools versus Seattle School District Number 1, also known as the PICS case. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. And they decided that plans, school assignment plans based on race were uh, no longer allowed. They can't cool. use race as the sole, sole determining factor for assigning students to schools. Okay. Yeah, and John Roberts had a had a pretty famous quote. I'm paraphrasing here, so I might get it wrong, but it was basically saying the best way to get rid of discrimination based on race is to not discriminate by race. And it just all these, and there have been other other decisions. Um, since then and around that time that have kind of walked back all the progress that was made during the the civil rights uh movement and it just it, that stuff rings hollow to me they're either really naive or they're being insincere like yeah that sounds great and in a vacuum that's right but you're just ignoring history right. and context yeah and everything else that's happened um, it's like saying, I don't see color. It's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. And, yeah. and that's not true. <laughs> I think we've and established we that. <laughs> and I don't, but I don't think we want it to be true. I mean, right. 
you don't see what, then you're not seeing history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you don't see color. You're, you're mm -hmm. dismissing, I mean, not only, you know, mm -hmm. our own past, but especially the, you know, black American experience, which is, you know, <laughs> we definitely should not forget it. We should remember it and, and try to, have some sort of restorative justice for it, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately, this Supreme Court has been doing the opposite. There's this case was, I think, um, a very poor decision. Um, basically, saying, "Oh, well, now we've made up enough time that we shouldn't look at we shouldn't look at race at all for anything." The trend is you make progress, you get backlash. And then, you know, some of your progress is, is wiped away. Well, it's like those two storylines I was talking about throughout history. Exactly. You have exactly. one storyline that's always like trying to make progress against racism, civil rights, but that doesn't mean that there aren't, isn't another line and a narrative of people who are going against yeah. that. You know, we actually finish our tour, um, reading from Vance's speech, A Scattered Nation. He'll give this speech many, many times throughout the late 1800s. Um, and he is basically, The Scattered Nation is, is a speech he's giving advocating for some Jewish people. Um, hmm. It's a very interesting speech. Hmm. Um, nice. It's a confusing <laughs> speech. Um, but I um, specify some, um, but he, in one part of it, we read a quote um, on, at the end of the tour. So our tour, we spend, you know, 45 minutes or so talking about life on an um, early 1800s land station in Western North Carolina. Um, and, and basically the idea that, you know, Vance is able to do what he does because he, there are 18 enslaved people laboring and, 27 enslaved people total associated with the Vance family that, you know, he is able to build his career on the backs of. Um, so we asked people to think about that and the fact that he would then go on to say in the late 1800s that um, call African-Americans um, barbarians and then would say um, that they have literally offered nothing to society in that speech. So we read this and then we encourage people to, um, think about his actions and his statements and the impact that that still has on today. So um, I guess that's one of my questions for you is, you know, you you know a lot about the different cases and you've talked about kind of the parallels from following Julius Chambers. <laughs> We've talked about how he's the opposite of Vance, but how do you think um, these different cases that you've referenced um, relate to today? I mean, you've brought it up almost to present day. So how do you think they relate or impact what's happening today? Um, I think a lot of it has probably, you know, you see the ebbs and flows. You see a lot of the progress made during civil rights during the Warren Court, which is kind of considered a very liberal progressive court then you get the Rehnquist court which was you know the backlash of that and that's un kind of continued on into the Roberts court where they've undone a lot that was that was done during um the Warren court and I think you're seeing a lot of the the, the protesting now is I mean there's certainly some some cases that I think, I mean, you hear a lot of people wanting to get rid of qualified immunity, which is um, case law. Unfortunately, that is, has, was not a split. Uh, those are not split cases. Lots of, uh, most of the uh, justices agree with that, which basically makes it more difficult to sue a police officer civilly. Um, I see. Makes it nearly impossible, honestly. You have to show that the police officer violated someone's rights 
and knew that they were violating their rights because there was um, a case prior that had very similar facts, almost the same facts that they should have known. Uh, but, but if you're never able to show that, which most of them aren't, how do you get that into the case law to mm -hmm. then show it? it's, you know, it, mm -hmm. it doesn't really make much sense. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to show it very closely and you can't even, you can't even get past that to get into court. That's, that's, you know, the mm -hmm. immunity, you don't even get to present your case. Um, I think that's one of them. The other one that always sticks out to me is the um, use of force standard, which comes from Graham v. Connor, um, which states that um, when a police officer uses force, um, the standard to decide whether they're liable or not is what a reasonable police officer in that situation would have done. Um, mm -hmm. And this one really bothers me because of the history of America, so many white people, I, I, almost, pretty much everybody has some implicit bias, mm -hmm. you know, We've been programmed through a lot of ways to and, and immediately fear a black person or, or fear them more or see them as a threat um, in many situations. And so when you get these juries and you ask them, was it reasonable for this officer to fear for his life under the situation? Many of them are going to say, yeah, because they feel like it is reasonable. Does a mm -hmm. black guy, you know, he's automatically more of a threat to me, even though they may not want to consciously admit that. Mm -hmm. I think we have enough studies, um, that show that if anybody's interested, the, the Harvard implicit bias mm -hmm. um, uh, site's good for that to kind of, if you want to experience it yourself. Um, so that's another one that I, that I think is, um, has kind of uh, come up with a lot of what's going on today. I mean, I know most of it's focused on uh, police and law enforcement. Right. Um, so those, those are the two, and and to to finish off, off Dr. Chambers' story, yep. um, 1984, he became the director of the LDF. Mm -hmm. Then even 92 or 93, he came back and was the chancellor at North Carolina Central University, mm -hmm. where my parents were born. And then um, he passed away in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, but... Uh, thinking about him and thinking about uh, just everything that he pushed through and dealt with and, and persevered in order to make ch changes and to make, I think the world more just as he saw it, as many of us see it. Mm -hmm. Um, it reminds me, I think he kind of lived this, which was a quote from Charles Hamilton Houston, who was one of his uh, idols. So we spoke about him earlier and paraphrasing here is something like um, as lawyers, you're either a social engineer or you're a parasite on, on society. Um, so, it, it reminds me of what's going on today. You see a lot of the quotes of, you know, that there's no neutral now. If you're silent, you're on the side of the oppressors. And, and so I think for a lot in the legal field, I think a lot of us feel a duty to get involved and not, you know, stay out of the way of everything. Um, mm -hmm. And to to be a little more idealistic maybe and, and proactive because uh, that's certainly what Dr. Chambers did. Mm -hmm. Well, I, there are some overlap there with the museum field, I think as well. Um, you know, to museums not being uh, neutral spaces 
I think for a long time there was this idea um, of objectivity where your interpreter at your site is always supposed to be objective. And it's like, that's sure would be great, but not realistic. And um, mm -hmm. also like, you know, I think a lot of public historians feel um, it is important to contextualize so that people can understand why, um, you know, some of the things are happening that are happening. Yeah, I hadn't thought about that, but definitely. And I feel like when people say objective in the, in the history department, they mean you go with what's the current and past interpretation. Yeah, it's more like, okay, they've used it as objective as like, you're not supposed to have, like when I give a tour, you're not necessarily supposed to hear my opinion. Right. Which is what I mean when I say that's unrealistic. Like, you're going to be yeah. able to tell what my opinion is on tour. Um, mm -hmm. And you're right. I think by not having my, uh, addressing my opinion, and then I'm just going to, I would just go with whatever the interpretation has always been. Mm -hmm. So it's then that, that means not, no challenging of anything, kind of. But. Um, so clearly, uh, Julius Chambers, uh, means a lot to you. Mm -hmm. So is there anything else that you would like to say about him or that you want the public to know? Yes. So there is a, a nonprofit organization, the Julius Chambers Center for Civil Rights, I believe is the name of it. Um, uh, they challenge discrimination um, with their cases in housing and school and environmental justice. Um, so I think they kind of are carrying on his his mission and his legacy, and I think that's why they named it after him. So that's what I do donate to, and I think anyone who who agrees with um, Dr. Chambers, um, I guess use of the world um it's a good good place to to donate thanks a lot i really appreciate you covering all of that content that was a lot <laughs> all right all right i'll talk to you later right, bye bye